I've been a preacher for more than 30 years. I've studied and taught through the book of Genesis in churches all around the world. And I've trained pastors in the skills of interpreting texts. It was my personal goal to research hell. And so I made it my goal to research hell and find out, is it what Jesus taught? Is it what the apostles taught? Is that really the teaching of the Bible? And I found that it wasn't. Jesus taught about Gehenna. And in that verse, he's actually warning people about Gehenna. Gehenna was the... Before we get into today's content, on behalf of the Fifth Kind TV, I want to say a big thank you to Surfshark for sponsoring today's content. Surfshark is a VPN that allows us all to become citizens of the world through online access. If you're like me, you'll enjoy watching online content from countries all around the world. But I live in Australia, and what I'm shown in internet searches will be different to what you're shown in Canada, America, the Philippines, Germany, the Netherlands, or wherever you're watching from. By using Surfshark, I'm able to access a world of online content and see all the things that you see and many other things beside. Surfshark enables us to become citizens of the world through online availability. Get fully protected. Follow the link in the description, sign up and use the promo code FIFTHKIND to receive an 85% discount. Plus, you'll get three months for free. Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so if you try it and you don't like it, you can easily cancel your subscription and receive a full refund. With Surfshark, you can swim under the radar in the sea of online content. What is your take on the verses where Jesus says it is better to pluck out your eye than risk hell? Yes, that's a pretty graphic verse. And how do people interpret that? Well, you can travel the world, visit every kind of church on planet Earth, and you'll realize that nobody takes the first half of that teaching literally. You don't find Christians who've got one eye or one hand or one leg because their hand was leading them into sin, and so they chopped it off, just as Jesus said. People don't take it literally. They understand that uh, there is a moral to this teaching and that Jesus is saying, look, if you've got something that has the potential to ruin your life, don't do it. If there's some vulnerability you have that stands to ruin your family, ruin your soul, don't do it. That really is what he's saying. Uh, you know, it's better to, I mean, just for a really practical example, if you have a struggle with moderating your drinking, don't drink. That is, that is an obvious application of that teaching that people have made through the ages around the world. And I think that's very sane. I think that is what's intended by that teaching. But what is curious is that there are lots of Christian believers who will take the first half for its moral meaning and then take the second half absolutely literally. So they won't be chopping off hands or plucking out eyes, but they will be warning about hell and eternal conscious torment, but doing the wrong thing or not being a believer. And I think that's illogical to take the first half figuratively and the second half literally. I think if you take the first half figuratively, do the same to the second half. And when I went to theological college many, many years ago, it was my personal goal to research hell because I became a believer when I was 17 from a background in atheism. And I always felt that the church's teaching on hell was really out of kilter with everything else I was picking up about the teaching of Jesus. This, it is so out of proportion. I mean, an eternal punishment for a finite crime can only be a miscarriage of justice. And if I would feel sorry for someone burning alive forever, 
then how could a God of love not feel sorry for them? I can't be more compassionate than God, can I? I knew straight away there was something really off about this doctrine. And so I made it my goal to research hell and find out, is it what Jesus taught? Is it what the apostles taught? Is that really the teaching of the Bible? And I found that it wasn't. Jesus taught about Gehenna. And in that verse, he's actually warning people about Gehenna. Gehenna was the rubbish tip outside of Jerusalem. So if you're going to take it literally, he's warning you about an ancient rubbish tip outside Jerusalem that no longer exists. So for the literalists, there's the literal meaning. But again, he's using it figuratively. He's talking about the trash heap of life. If you've got something that threatens to ruin your life and end you up on the trash heap of life, get rid of it. You don't want to end up there full of regret and remorse, unable to go back and change things. So uh, that's how I take that. Read the Gehenna texts in the New Testament and you'll realize that's what Jesus is on about. He's not warning about eternal conscious torment in hell, which is a monstrous idea. And traditionally, Christians have threatened people all around the world with that if they're not Orthodox Christians, threatening you know, men, women, and children with that horrific specter. It's not what Jesus taught. Gehenna is a place of ruination, and you should make every effort to avoid it. That is what Jesus was really on about. That's my view. I go into that in depth in the Eden conspiracy for anyone who's concerned about it. And it's a doctrine really worth unraveling because it's been used to manipulate people through the ages to not think for themselves, to do what the religious authorities tell them. And I think it has been a psychologically very damaging thing for individuals and for us as a culture. And it, it has made us um, timid and unsure of our own intellect and unsure of our own moral conscience. It's made us passive so that we wait to be told what's what rather than thinking for ourselves. And I think it's something that must be undone. And that's why in the Eden Conspiracy, I take quite some time over it, showing how ill-founded that whole doctrine really is. The miracles of Jesus, how did he do that? Was it just made up stories? Did Jesus really have the ability? Thank you, Paul. That's a great question. I have come to the view that in the Gospels, we have quite a cocktail of story. Some of the stories told about Jesus are very recognizable to people who study uh, world religions or classical literature. So you've got themes like the empty tomb, walking on water, multiplying food that you can find in other story around the world. You can find it in stories of Buddha. You can find it in stories from out of ancient Egypt. And it's not difficult to see that certain tropes are being used to make a point about Jesus. So, for instance, in the Gospel of Mark, it begins with the writer saying, the beginning of the good news of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. So he's just told you what he's going to tell you. He's told you what his book is about. And at the end of the Gospel of Mark, there's this empty tomb, which is a trope used in classical literature to say that the character is now among the gods. The character has now proven divine. And so that trope is used to make the theological point announced at the beginning of the book. So I think some of the miracle stories may simply be tropes being applied by the writers to make the point that we should see Jesus as a divine figure. However, I think there are other stories in there that may be founded in something real. Now, people do debate as to whether or not Jesus was a real historic figure. I am persuaded that he was, and that's because the distortion of the Jesus story is so easy to track. If you study Eusebius and the way he distorted the story of the battle for the Milvian Bridge, 
Constant and the emperor asked Eusebius to write that history and to write it a certain way. He wanted to tell the world that Jesus Christ had enabled him to win that battle because Jesus Christ is a supporter of Rome, a supporter of Rome's military campaigns, and a supporter of him as the emperor. And when Eusebius wrote that, on the one hand, he was presenting Constantine as a Christian, but on the other hand, he just recruited Jesus as a loyal Roman citizen. You look at the history of Roman art, and you will see that the way Jesus was portrayed shifted and shifted until in the 6th century, uh, I believe it is, there is a fresco of Jesus, and he is in Roman military uniform, looking quite Italian. So you can see there's been a distortion of the story of Jesus. And the fact there's been a distortion tells me that the original Jesus was actually quite inconvenient to the story of empire. And that's one of the things that persuades me there really was an historic Jesus. If there was, then I believe he was a teacher and a healer. I think that's really the core of his story. Uh, that's how I see him as a teacher and a healer. And his modalities of healing are things I've experienced for myself. So I don't have any difficulty believing in many of those stories. So when I was very young, there was a lady in the church I attended who people laid hands on her and prayed for her just in the way that Jesus did. They addressed a condition and an eye with no optic nerve had sight restored to it. Now, I, that counts as a miracle, I think. We can't explain how that happened with our conventional science, but we followed a particular modality that we'd seen modeled in the Gospels, and now an eye with no optic nerve was seeing. And on my website, Paul Anthony Wallace, I've got a fuller telling of that story. It was an amazing experience. And I've seen a number of things like that happen through laying on of hands, through addressing conditions as if they are intelligent through in shared intention through fasting and i would say if i can experience healing in those kinds of ways it's really not a stretch for me to think that jesus might have done as well for real so if jesus existed yes that's who i think he was i think he was a teacher and a healer and i think he was using modalities that are open to all of us this was part of his teaching he said the things you've seen me do these and even greater things will you do he presented himself as a model and as an example not some figure to be worshipped and that's how i view those jesus stories what is the most accurate holy bible in your opinion and which one do you consider the most corrupted Oh, uh, the most corrupted. Well, that's a good question. I'll have to have a think about that. But when people ask me about getting deeper into studying the texts, because a lot of my work talks about the root meaning of key words. And I say, when you look at those, the story of paleo contact becomes unmissable. And so a lot of correspondents say, well, how do I do that? You know, I've got a New International Version Bible. How do I do that? I've got a Good News Bible. How do I do that? I've got a King James. How do I do that? The best next step is to have a couple of translations and to always use more than one translation when you're looking at a text. And that can clue you as to where the translation issues are. But if you really want to get to the root meanings, get to the bottom of things, what you need is an interlinear Bible. And what that is, is a Bible where you've got the, if, if your language is English, there'll be an English translation, and then there will be the Hebrew words underneath for the Hebrew scriptures, or the Greek words underneath for the New Testament scriptures. And you will use that book, that Bible, alongside a lexicon. And a lexicon allows you to look up those Hebrew words and Greek words and see how they're used in different contexts. Find out what the roots of those words are, and then go back and look at those verses again. Read them again using the root meanings, and you'll, you'll understand why the translator made that choice or that choice, but you'll also see what the primitive meaning is. And from time to time, you'll find the primitive meaning and think, oh my goodness, I can see why they didn't translate that straight. 
but it's all there. This is the wonderful thing about the biblical scriptures. We do still have Hebrew originals we can go to. We do still have Greek originals we can go to and probe these root meanings. So getting into linear, I use a, a Greek interlinear for the Septuagint. That's the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures that Jesus and the apostles quoted from and a Greek interlinear for the New Testament. I use a lexicon called the Bauer, the Ant, Gingrich, and Danker. Uh, that's for the New Testament. And for the Hebrew scriptures, I'd recommend Brown, Driver, Briggs. Now, these are quite expensive resources, but if you want to start dipping your toe in these waters, there are online resources you can use as well. So Bible Hub will give you interlinear texts for free online, and then you can get yourself a lexicon and study that further. Um, before getting to that stage, a Bible translation I particularly like is the New Jerusalem Bible. And I should give a shout out to the senior editor for that Bible, Dom Henry Wansborough, who gave me great assistance when I was writing Escaping from Eden. When I was probing the word Elohim and working out why do we translate it as God when it seems to mean the powerful ones? Why is it a plural? And why does it sometimes have plural verb forms and sometimes singular? And as I was puzzling that out and feeding my way forwards to a paleo contact reading, Dom Henry Wansborough gave me great one-on-one -on -one help in that process. And I've seen him speak about the process they brought to the Bible in producing the New Jerusalem. And what I love about it is it's very transparent in how it translates the different words that have been rendered as God through the ages. So you can really see what's going on. And the editorial notes and footnotes are very, very honest. So if you come to a passage where Elohim is in the plural and it looks you looks like you're in a polytheistic world, the editorial notes won't hide that. When it comes to a passage that's clearly based on the Sumerian story, the editorial notes won't hide that. So if you can get hold of a New Jerusalem Bible, the expanded study edition, I think you're getting one of the best Bibles available. How do you think humanity will cope with full disclosure? Do you think that our generations have been primed for these times? I.A. Star Trek, Close Encounters, Star Wars, etc. Thank you for all that you share. Well, I certainly think we have been primed for these times. I think that is the purpose of a lot of our ancestral stories. And that's what I argue for in Escaping from Eden, The Scars of Eden, Echoes of Eden, The Eden Conspiracy, and now The Invasion of Eden. I believe our ancestors wanted us to know that we are part of a populated cosmos, that we have company on this planet and always have had. And many of these ancient stories do find their ways into the scripts of TV series, movies, science fiction, not just science fiction, other kinds of literature as well. So, for instance, the Epic of Gilgamesh, the oldest written story known to humanity, that gets retold by Rudyard Kipling in The Jungle Book. It gets retold by Edgar Rice Burroughs in the stories of Tarzan. The idea of the primitive human being civilized by a more advanced female being who then prepares the primitive human for city living and sophistication. That's the Epic of Gilgamesh. That's the story of Shamhat and Enkidu, retold as Tarzan and Mowgli. So, you know, script writers know what they're doing. Writers are readers. And sometimes there's a very deliberate retelling of ancient story. The Marvel Universe is a great example of that right now, which is full of Plato and full of ancestral narratives. So, yes, I think we have been primed for contact. How will humanity cope? I think humanity will cope just fine. I mean, recent polling in the States indicates that if the government were suddenly to step forward and say, we've been in contact for more than 70 years, 67% of the American population would say, yes, I'd more or less work that out for myself. 
So I don't think we're looking at a scenario of blind panic like we're seeing in the three-body problem. I think a lot of people have worked out we've got company. We are in a populated cosmos. And frankly, if our ancestors could cope with that idea, why on earth would we not be able to? So I think humanity is more than ready to come to terms with being in a populated cosmos. I think as for full disclosure, I think the authorities are doing their best to, to avoid that uh, and instead to do a drip drip of soft disclosure. So small disclosures being made from year to year so that we will work out what's going on bit by bit. I don't think um, so far as it lies in their power that any government will want to step forward and say we are in contact and we have been for more than seven decades. That's the information that's coming out, but it's coming out sort of one degree removed from an official announcement. So it's the former chief of space security for Israel who has said that. The uh, now former prime minister of Russia said it, although he was still in office when he said it back in 2008. Former Minister of Defence for Canada, Paul Hellyer, has said it. Um, lots of former employees of uh, defence around the world are saying it. But they're saying it without consequence. You know, they're not being arrested for breaching official secrets laws or NDAs. And so you have to be able to read that. There's a lot of information out there. The hearing of last year, there was real information being revealed in that hearing. And there isn't blind panic about it. So I think humanity is more than ready to cope with the idea of contact. I think the difficulty is the potential political fallout of, well, who's in charge then? And on whose authority has this been kept secret? I think that's the turbulent aspect of the question. But since it's been a stable arrangement, since we've been in contact and we haven't all been eaten, I think that's reassuring in the first instance. But to understand why the world works in the way it does, I think we have to understand that there has been contact, there is contact, and that that does indeed impinge upon the geopolitics of the world in which we all live. Hi, thank you for sharing your research with the world. I look forward to your next video. My questions are, given your background, how do you think Abrahamic religions will react to the confirmation of extraterrestrial life? For example, do you think they will adapt and adopt this information or do you believe they will essentially become somewhat obsolete? In addition to that, do you believe that the definitive confirmation will happen in your lifetime? Well, Aaron, I think the Abrahamic religions will certainly have to adapt if it suddenly becomes clear that we're in a populated cosmos. I don't think it's beyond their scope to adapt, but I think for some it'll be really hard work. I mean, I can speak personally. It took a lot of rethinking and reframing of my beliefs to come to terms with there being paleo contact in the Bible and in human history. It does alter your understanding of God if humanity is just one of many species and maybe a, a middle ranking species in the cosmos rather than the, the top of the tree. So my faith has had to adapt. I still have a notion of God. I would still count myself a follower of Jesus. So I would count myself as a, a case study that faith can adapt to new information. And I think there was an effort made by the Roman Catholic Church back in 2009 to prime, at the very least, Catholic believers around the world for that kind of a shift, that kind of a journey. So this is the story of the colloquium, which was held in 2009 by the Pontifical Academy of Sciences at the request of Pope Benedict XVI, who I should say was the most conservative pope in my lifetime. I'm not a Roman Catholic. I don't usually follow the uh, statements of popes. But when he called upon the Pontifical Academy of Sciences to discuss the theological implications of contact with other civilizations, I had to raise an eyebrow. And in the year leading up to that symposium and in the year following, 
there were spokespeople for the Curia meeting the press, very senior figures, Reverend Dr. Guy Consolmagno, Father Jose Gabriel Funes, Monsignor Corrado Balducci, who were speaking really for the Curia and saying there is no theological issue with contact with ETs. We should not be surprised to meet them. We should be ready to embrace them as a brother or sister alien. We should expect it sooner than anyone expects. And there's no theological issue. It just means the creator has been busier than we thought. Now, when those conversations were had, I think that was a very real effort to help believers and anyone paying attention around the world to begin adapting their faith and their worldview to the possibility of a populated cosmos. Clearly, they believe their faith could adapt to embrace this information. I think it does force people back to their sources, whether they're reading the Quran or the Bible or other scriptures, to go back and say, did I miss this? Now, I had to do this for myself, and I went back to the Bible, and I realized, yes, I did miss this. Yes, there are aliens in the Bible. Yes, there are narratives of ET contact in the Bible, which are there, have been missed, mistranslated, experiences of contact suppressed in Christianity, ideas about populated universe punished, sometimes with capital punishment through the ages. But now the Roman Catholic Church is saying, maybe we got that wrong. Maybe we shouldn't have immolated Giordano Bruno in 1600 for suggesting there may be life on other planets. And so they're saying, yes, we can adapt. I believe that people of faith can adapt to this information, but it will reframe a lot of beliefs, and we need to be ready for that. And I think the church at large has been super slow to engage with this. I think it's been shocking for people who have had close encounter experiences or who have honestly seen paleo contact in the Bible, the way they have been silenced and gaslighted by the church has been appalling. The lack of pastoral response to contactees and experiences, I think, is deplorable. And I think the churches are going to have to really run to catch up if there are more significant disclosures in the years ahead. Where are the church's statements on the hearing of last year and what believers should do with that information? Where are the pastoral letters to clergy? helping them to deal with people experiencing close encounters. Why is it that when believers have these experiences, they have to go outside the church and go to secular therapists and secular regression therapists or secular experts because it's a taboo within the churches? I think taboo has no place in modern religion and uh, the churches really need to get with it. And I hope that my books, the Eden series, are a bit of a provocation to people in faith communities to engage with these topics and religious leaders to engage with these topics and uh, not keep their heads buried in the sand about something that is real in the present and has been real all through the aeons of human experience. Any new collaborations or books coming out after the Eden series? Ah, after the Eden series. Well, I, the Eden series has a bit more life in it yet. I do have another book in the pipeline. I'm pretty sure Eden is going to be somewhere in the title. And it will be flowing from a collaboration. So the Eden conspiracy really flowed from my collaboration with Mauro Bellino which you can watch on The Fifth Kind. And there we work together, getting to the root meanings of the key words and unearthing these ancient stories of paleo contact. Maro Bellino was a, is a very eminent, widely respected Bible translator. He produced interlinear translations for Vatican-approved Bibles. And through his work, he discovered the paleo contact layer. And we worked together. The Eden Conspiracy resulted from that. The Invasion of Eden, 
there's a little bit of input there from my collaboration with Matt LaCroix. And in fact, this very month, I am flying to Turkey, where I will be doing some archaeological work with Matthew. And the work we do there is going to turn up in the next book in the Eden series. So that's that collaboration. I anticipate a bit of collaboration with Praveen Mohan making its way into the next book as well. And there's a wonderful interview that we recorded with Praveen on The Fifth Kind, if you want a clue as to where we're going with that. So right now, those are the collaborations that are furthering my research path. And yes, that will always translate into books because I can't help but share the journey. And how far that will take the Eden series? Well, watch this space. If you enjoy our content here on Fifth Kind TV and would like to support our work, please would you consider subscribing to our new website, fifthkind.tv. Here we will have our full catalogue of material along with exclusive access to interviews and documentary content. Sign up today, become part of the community, become part of the conversation. Thank you so much for your support and I'll see you there.